Welcome to Ignite Agility. Today, I have joining me Jeff Staggs and Niels Gott with CCO, the Center for Coaching and Organizations. Hello, Niels and Jeff. Angela, great to be here. Thanks for great joining. To see you, Angela. Good to see you. Why don't we have Jeff start? Just say a few words sure. about yourself, and then we'll have Niels say a little bit about himself. Yeah, thanks, Angela. Yeah, I am Jeff Staggs. I'm a founder, one of the founders of Center for Coaching and Organizations and the program director. And I'm a master certified coach with the International Coach Federation and have been contemplating the kinds of questions we're talking about today for a long time from a coaching perspective. So I'm really excited to get into this since you asked this provocative question, Angela. Right. And um, I've been trying to think of a catchy title about assuming positive intent, something about, uh, you know, is the path to hell paved with good intentions? I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll have to play around with that. Something like that. Something like <clears throat> that, right? Niels, why don't you say a few words about yourself? Thanks, Angela. So I'm Niels Gott. I'm a positive psychology practitioner. I'm one of the founding partners of CCO, and I'm an ICF coach. Also military veteran, spent 22 years in uniform, and actually that's what led me to coaching these days. I discovered positive psychology while I was in service. And so now that I'm out, that is brought me around to coaching, where I too am uh, intrigued by the question of positive intent. And I think that uh, the more we discuss this, the better chance we have to unlock some personal interactions that might go a little awry. Yeah. yeah. So let's get right into it. You know, we've probably all heard either in some sort of coaching practice, or we've gone to a training class or just read advice, you should assume positive intent, assume positive intent in others. Let's start with Jeff. What do you think a definition? What, what is in positive intent? What is assume well, positive intent? Well, before I answer that, I think one of the things I think about this kind of question is, is like, we treat it so superficially, we think we know until mm. we really ask the question. So I love you asking the provocative question. So like, what is it really? Mm -hmm. And for me, when you get down to like kind of the root, it's, it's actually a question for me. It's not about the other person. It's about, am I starting from a place where I'm grounded and reflective and not reactive to whatever is happening out here with the other person? So it's a statement for me to remind myself, it's not about actually the other person or what's happening. So I think that when I look at really what it, the intent is, it's for me to come from a new place, a different place than being in reaction. So yeah. that's where I would start with answering that question, Angela. Niels, anything different or anything to add? Well, I love that. And I think that what I would add is that other people matter. That's one of the tenets yeah. of positive psychology. And I think that Chris Peterson apparently said that uh, some years ago. And, and so to, to Jeff's point about it's not about me, um, uh, it's so easy. I think about plenty of times in, in my past where uh, I've flown off the handle at first information that, that wasn't actually accurate. I was really great at making up a story instead of assuming positive mm. intent. And uh, that's where the interactions can really go wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that ego, right? That little internal voice that loves to yeah. spin up tall tales. So a coworker who's late for a conversation, would it be really easy for my ego to say, "Ugh, that Neil's right, just late again. I'm sure he just blew it off. He just, he just forgot when we don't know. Maybe something yeah, happened know. with the kids. Maybe he's helping somebody change a flat tire on the side of the road. I mean, until we have the information, we just don't know. No. And so, so it's an invitation for me to step into relationship with you in a particular kind of way that Niels is talking about from the positive psychology and valuing you first. Mm -hmm. Do you think context is important? So I read something <clears throat> and I can't remember where I would certainly cite it if I could remember where, but the, the context situation was a parent saying something like assume positive intent. Yeah, right. Like I'm going to do that when there's a registered sex offender that moves into the neighborhood and I have a young child. I'm not going to assume positive intent. I'm going to assume the worst. And I'm like, well, that's an extreme. That's an extreme 
uh, set of circumstances or context, but do we think context is important? I'm going to start with Jeff and then we'll, we'll hear from Niels. That's a great question. You know, these extremes kind of, they expose, I think some of the limits perhaps, but it also um, shows, I think what happens if we don't shift our stance. Because if I just go to my reaction in this case, like, and assume the worst, what happens? Well, then now we're in a conflict. I've made that person less than human. And um, I'm not in a place to do something really resourceful for my child. And I might actually traumatize my child with that reaction. Doesn't, doesn't mean, so assuming positive intent doesn't mean that I'm not discerning but that, it, that it's like, I come to a place where I can actually be discerning and what, how do I respond is what I would say to that. that. I really and, like what you said about limits there. You know what I mean? Or just recognizing some mm -hmm. of those limits. And I'm sorry, what else were you going to say, Jeff? Yeah, no, but uh, keep going with your thought or Niels, we'd love to hear. Yeah, chime in, you know, Niels. What do you have to say? Because I've, you know, I'm not just buying into that position there. Well, I think that context matters insofar as it, it helps to helps our egos to create some extra stories. And so um, you gave an extreme example there, mm -hmm. Angela, but I think that that's we're always in choice. And so we have an opportunity to show up uh, and recognize the bias that we have that we bring to the situation uh, because context always colors the interaction. Uh, mm -hmm. But I've in my experience, it, again, I feel like it gives me an excuse to make up a story because right away I'm thinking about, uh, I'm thinking about traffic, uh, oddly enough, and how um, maybe this is a common experience, one. <laughs> but well, it, right, you know, I know that behind the wheel, I can certainly make up some stories, and that's uh, mm -hmm. that's a, a context where I'm not great at assuming positive intent, uh, and so um, that's why I'm recognizing that context it, it matters insofar as how we're shaping how we show up. Uh, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be prudent people, but I think the other thing is that emotional intelligence is what matters. And so in the example that you gave, that's as a, if I were that parent, it's a chance for me to show up and recognize the, pe the person that I want to model. Of course, I'm going to be prudent. I'm always going to keep the safety of my family uh, it, first and foremost in everything and all the decisions that I make. But I'm also going to want to use that as an opportunity to demonstrate critical thinking and how I can be prudent and how I can show up uh, in the best way possible. Uh, and so positive intent isn't about being irrational and it's not about being naive. Um, it's about being a thinking human being and recognizing that the person on the other side of this interaction has a whole identity that I likely don't have any access to at all. And the best thing that I can do is give them the benefit of the doubt. I love too where you're pointing, Niels, about how context gives us an us an excuse to shape our stories for better or worse, you know, and they're just stories until we really come back to discernment and come back to who is the other person. And regardless of who they are, what kind of respect do they need to be treated as with rather? Um, yeah. And the, the, the two kind of, I guess what I will label misuses of assuming positive intent. So getting right into the meat of it here is it's almost like some people are using it as an excuse to police behavior in others, almost like saying, you know, here's whose intention matters and in justifying microaggressions or justifying behavior and the second part of that, which I think is the meteor part, is the, <clears throat> I think Jeff, you and I called it the get out of jail free card. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and I was talking to Jeff about something that happens to me quite a bit as an example. I want to hear your reactions and your thoughts to this. Um, social media, right? Which right there, I mean, there's just so much that we could say about that context. Sometimes not all that social. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so we've all got followers. We've all got stuff that we're doing. And, um, but the two instances were very clearly somebody marketing their service, marketing their own product and marketing their own event. 
and they tagged me. And I'm like, wait a minute. Cause now all my followers are seeing it and I don't necessarily endorse this product in one case. And another one was, I have nothing to do with that event, nor do I plan on attending or nor am I going to endorse it. And so um, LinkedIn lets you remove your mention, remove your tag. So I removed my tag. And then I, I just was very transparent, you know, with the, the people in question saying, um, I just removed my mention because I don't want to give people the impression that I'm involved in this. And I got a very defensive, and again, here's my ego, right? Because it just, it sounded defensive in the way that I was reading it in print, who knows, you know, what it really was or not, but it was, I was assuming positive intent. What? You, you used my name to promote your service. What do you mean you were assuming positive intent? Didn't make any sense to me. What are your thoughts about yeah. that? Well, it's, go ahead, Neil. <laughs> I'm assuming that you possibly attempt to sell my course for me. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like it's turning it around and leaving the other person out completely when used in that way. It's like, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to assume positive intent. So I've got a free hall pass. Get yeah. out of jail. Yeah. I'm not responsible. <laughs> so... Gosh, that's just completely the opposite. It, in, it excludes the other person. Right. That's what I thought. And that's why yeah. I wanted to have this conversation because I'm like, I know I'm bothered and I'm not really sure why <laughs> I am bothered. But, yeah. you know, is, is assume positive intent being so overused in some of our coaching practices that we've lost the plot, you know, that it's gotten well, and, just misused. You know, I think where it gets misused too is like, like I'm a well-intentioned white privileged male. And if I say something and somebody, a person of color says that's racist. And I say, well, I was, you know, my intentions were good. How come you can't, you know, assume positive intent? It's like, well, I ought to get a buy. Yeah. And I think that's a misuse. And it, it, is a it misuse, also yeah. leaves the other person out because now I'm defending versus him assuming positive intent. Right. So I'm not actually assuming positive intent on their part in saying something I've done is out of bounds. Like, like I'm not aware, but instead I fall back on my white fragility and say, but I, what about positive intent? Don't I get a buy? <laughs> no, we don't. We don't well, come on now, I ought to. <laughs> But no. Yeah, I completely agree. I think the example you gave there, Jeff, is what some people are very frustrated by and would call that a microaggression, right? Like yeah. a like a license to to get a buy or to get a hall pass. Because absolutely, it, yeah, yeah. yeah so so think, there, it's like if you really assume positive intent, it's like, whoa, boy. I get that I wasn't aware. I get I maybe I had positive intent. And hold on, let me balance myself because I notice I'm defending. So help me understand. Because I trust that you are coming across with positive intent and you're not, you're not making something up. You're not trying to make me a bad person. You're just saying what's true for you. And I need to understand that. Now that would be assuming positive intent in that situation. Yeah. And it's about the other person. It's not about you. It's right. not about you. <clears throat> It's about right. the person you're interacting with. What are your thoughts on that, Niels? I love that. And I think that that's really timely. I mean, uh, you know, we all have to take personal responsibility for how we show up. And so the other thing that I'm thinking about also is, is the role of empathy uh, in this situation. Um, there was a great video some years ago from Cleveland Clinic. And I think that they put this video together to, uh, I think it was for their staff primarily, but it was recognizing that we've all got any number of things going on in our lives at any time. And, and like like kids that. in the background. And that I was just going to say, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah, like a five-year-old having I was going to yeah. say, was that Jeff's dog so, or was that? <laughs> I believe that's a five-year-old. I, I don't that's know. That's a what, five-year-old. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what the and, struggle is currently. But, there are many. Uh, but we'll so, assume positive intent. 
I better assume positive intent. You know, that's another rich uh, area, just parenting. <laughs> Admittedly, I, I miss the mark on occasion. So uh, but it's a good reminder that, uh, you know, there's a whole experience happening there with that other human being. And so how can I check my ego at the door and, and just connect with them where they are uh, and you know, figure out what's going on? So yeah. maybe that's the thing that's missing. So you said empathy. Maybe really it's demonstrating empathy for the other person because you don't have all the facts, you know, be, you know, because our ego might be spinning a tall tale because we're missing certain things and trying to make up for it. If we embrace empathy, that might get us closer to the, the true intent of this as opposed to <clears throat> misusing it and thinking it's a hall pass or a get out of jail free card. Yeah. Well, that makes me ask the question, like, how do we be in integrity with the true intent of this? Like, how do we actually practice this with integrity versus trying to get a hall pass or, you know, cover up my defense or whatever? Yeah, one thought that I think I was uh, sharing with you before our chat today is it's not enough. It's, it's not enough on its own to just say right. we will assume positive intent or I'm going to assume positive intent in this other person that in of itself isn't enough it is remembering to be empathetic it is remembering the context and how you're showing up and maybe just rules of engagement with mm -hmm. the other person right to have some sort of conversation because if you say well let's let's check ourselves let's let's see where we're at can we really be honest with ourselves so maybe say to the other person help me understand like you said jeff what am i missing that that's kind of a engaging factor with mm -hmm. the other person. So it's not enough to just assume positive intent on its own. It's to, to check in with the other person, have some sort of rule of engagement or demonstrate some sort of empathy. Yeah. Those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head, but I don't know if there's anything. Yeah. Well, we, we gotta you know. recover the integrity of it. Cause otherwise it just becomes a flippant kind of a forism that you just throw out to, to move things on. It's like, well, let's move on. So I think you're right on, Angela, that it's not alone. It's not just enough to say it. It has to become a practice. And, yeah. you know, where Neil started was like, mm. every human being is valuable. Let's start from that place. And first come back, like, how am I going to engage this person? That's the first question for me. Like, how do I engage this person and trust that they have value? So it's first collect myself, then move to empathy, as Neil said. Absolutely. And I think what you're describing, Jeff, requires a great deal of humility to, to show up that way. Yeah. Um, and I think <clears throat> that's part of how we maintain that integrity is, mm -hmm. is recognizing that we, we don't have all the information uh, yeah. to show up that way. Yeah. I'm thinking about um, uh, on the not so social media, uh, I saw Adam Grant put a post, I think it was earlier today, because it's been just about a year since he released his last book, Think Again, uh, which, speaking of humility, is a great chance to recognize that we may not have all the information and uh, mm -hmm. the assumptions that we have formed or things that we thought were facts could be flawed in some way. And so he was putting that question out there, you know, what ways have you realized that you need to think again? Uh, and so yeah. I'm, I'm using that as a way to, to, to maintain integrity, at least as a, as a, a starting point to try to figure out yeah. how to keep this, you know, a, a real practice as opposed yeah. to a throwaway word like you mentioned. Yeah. As you say that, Niels, I think too, it's, you know, in the heart of the word, as, assuming it's like rethinking our <laughs> assumptions or suspending them mm -hmm. and coming, you know, first putting ourselves in a place of empathy, but then engaging the person with curiosity, like what is their experience and allowing it to be true for them whatever it is, whether we agree, disagree or not, that's their experience and you can't argue with it. Well, you can, but then you are an ass. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly right. And then you are being defensive and not listening, yeah. all those other things. It's like, oh my gosh, so we, we are making an ass out of both you and me. Um, exactly, I was thinking that, <laughs> but mostly me if I do that. <laughs> <laughs> With the couple of minutes um, we have left, what can you tell us about 
the, the CCO program, you know, the, the coaching program that would help people who are coaches like me, coaches like the two of you, as we start to want to get better with these practices and not use them for evil instead of good, you know, not to be an yeah. ass, to use them well, <laughs> for more yeah, positive outcomes. Well, I, I'd answer that on two levels. One is um, just get on our mailing list because we have community events like you do, Angela. We're going to be having those where people can come and ask questions and get best practices around coaching. It's going to help them improve. The other side is our executive coaching and organizations program, ECHO, really takes people into a deep dive around how do I show up? You know, it's a nine month program. How do I show up and taking these practices and building yourself as an instrument in a much deeper way so that you can engage people and have a really big impact. And so I think anybody who is an agile coach, it'll help deepen their practice and give them more tools. And I know Niels can speak to that firsthand. Well, I'd like to echo what you said about Echo. Thank you, Niels. See what I did there? <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. I, dad jokes. Can't help myself. Oh, um, I love them. They're, lovely. <laughs> They're very in addition, funny. <laughs> well played. You got me. Um, in addition to what, uh, what Jeff is saying about it, what the program allows us to recognize about how we show up is um, the core model of, of internal, external, and individual and collective, and really taking that that quadrant view, I, it has helped me immensely in, in systems and organizations um, because we've all got our internal identity that we show up with, um, but how we interact together in that system is really what's important. And that's to me why agile ways of working, uh, I mean, really the, the table stakes in my mind, but a lot of organizations haven't quite gotten there yet. And so mm -hmm. uh, what we do at CCO helps to sharpen that, that toolkit. And of course, we should mention in addition to the community events, we do have our summit coming up in April. So we're very excited right. about that event just right around the corner, uh, April 21st, be a fantastic day of hearing from some thought leaders in the from the global community mm -hmm. about ways that we can continue mm -hmm. to unlock the power of human potential through coaching and organizations. Yeah. So newsletter and uh, summit or program, how do folks learn about that? Is there a, a website or a URL to visit? <clears throat> www.centerforcoachinginorgs.com. Uh, all plugged together. Will you say that you one go. more time? And we will throw that in the comments uh, in the video below. Say it one more time, Niels. Center for Coaching in Orgs. Right. right down right here. Down below. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, well, Liz. I can't thank you enough for swinging by today. And if uh, our listeners like what they heard and want to know when we pump out new content, go ahead and hit subscribe. Thank you both gentlemen. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Angela. This was great fun. And next time you have another juicy question, give us a call. I definitely will. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Appreciate it.